Hello and welcome to Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Littman, the founder of the Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society and the coordinator and host of Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artist Series held each Wednesday from 11 a.m. to noon. I'd like to acknowledge we are hosting this webinar on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people here on beautiful Vancouver Island for whom we give thanks for this privilege and their stewardship from time eternal. We have much to learn. Today, we are most fortunate to have two of the world's leading water scientists, Dr. John Pomeroy and Dr. Trevor Davies as our guests. Introducing them is award-winning author, Bob Sanford, a senior advisor on water policy and the 20-year chair of water and climate security at the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. Welcome back, Bob. Well, thank you very much, Francis. And uh, I too am very pleased today to introduce two of the most respected people in the climate science community globally. Professor Trevor Davies was director of the Climatic Research Unit in the 1990s. This unit was established in 1972 at the University of East Anglia and was the first research unit to be fully dedicated to the study of climate change in the world. When the climate gate crises engulfed the climate, Climatic Research Unit and the global climate science community in 2009, just weeks, I should point out, before the failed UN Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen, Professor Davies was the University of East Anglia's pro-vice chancellor, which is to say also vice president for research, and played a central role in the response to the false assertions made by deniers. And in his presentation, Professor Davies will reflect on attempts to sabotage climate science then and now. Professor John Pomeroy serves as director of the University of Saskatchewan Center for Hydrology and the Canmore Cold Water Laboratory and leads Global Water Futures, a Canadian water research network that is the largest university-led freshwater research program in the world. Um, Dr. Pomeroy has for decades conducted research on water, snow and ice. Dr. Pomeroy today will discuss the advantages of using science to inform government water policy and decision-making and how the scientific discovery of the increasing risk of floods and droughts caused by climate change can inform evidence-based policy and decisions, including responding to the need for greater national capacity to predict future water security. Professor Davies, would you like to begin? Thanks for that introduction, Bob, and uh, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'd like to discuss some of the challenges facing climate science, science generally, um, in the light of my and our direct experience at the University of East Anglia of denialism and the, the rather hysterical response to it. This, this involved the research of the Climatic Research Unit or crew uh, and as Bob said this was established in 1972 as the first research unit in the world dedicated to the study of climate change. In the 1980s it started to compile the earth's temperature record during the instrumental period and this set the foundation for all subsequent temperature reconstructions. I was acting director for a short period in the the 1980s and then director of the unit 1993 to 98. And although its research had and still has a major impact in science and in the media, it was only ever a small unit, 25 people at maximum, including students. Everything went swimmingly for 37 years. Then in November, 2009, two weeks before the big United Nations Climate Conference in Copenhagen, emails which had been hacked over the previous two or three months were released and deniers used these to concoct a story about scientific fraud. Phil Jones, who was then director, was the main target. As Bob said, I, I was 
Vice President for Research at the University. And at that point in November 2009, Climate Gate entered the global vocabulary. There was a media deluge. Uh, claims that a small number of scientists in the UK uh, in the Climatic Research Unit with colleagues in the United States had perpetrated a global hoax over decades to exaggerate or falsify global warming. Here, here is uh, a measure of the print, print media interest. Uh, you can see there's a, a marked peak at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, that was Climate Gate. The no academic scientific establishment had before experienced such an overwhelming, intense, and hostile interest from the world's media. The later peaks going on to 2016, 2017. They were related to extreme weather events. Here are some of the uh, comments from the world's media and from politicians. Many portrayed the climate scientists, the hoaxers, as the criminals, not the hackers. Individuals at UEA and colleagues in the United States received threats, uh, very nasty threats, uh, death threats couched in the most horrible terms uh, to them and to their families. Um, of course, um, some of these politicians, you see the quotes, are still pretty active these days in terms of denying climate change. Crew felt very much on its own. There was little public support, especially from the science establishment. Some in the science community were very active in supporting the science, but not in supporting individual scientists, not realizing that if the deniers were successful in, in, in attacking the integrity of prominent individuals in climate science, they could also undermine the science itself. I was in touch with the, with the IPCC, with learned academic bodies, with various institutes and various government departments. And a typical response was, sorry, Trevor, we are going to hunker down and let, and let UEA take the heat on this. And it's interesting that Judith Curry, who's a uh, known as a contrarian scientist, reflected on this 10 years later. I think that many in the science community were politically naive. I see some of that naivety in the current response to the coronavirus. And I'll say a little bit about this in, in, in the next few minutes. Uh, there were very prominent exceptions in terms of support for individual scientists, support for crew and UEA, and uh, Prince Charles was one of those individuals who was very vociferous in his support. Now, denialism has been around for a long time, smoking, lead in petrol, vaccinations, and so on, and some of this has been well-funded, but Climate Gate was really when a number of orbits crossed. Denialism, uh, the widespread use of uh, social media, uh, the blogs, the blogosphere, uh, a mainstream media vacuum, since the mainstream media wanted to talk only to Phil Jones. Uh, he, 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 was the, he, he was the target for the deniers. And, and Phil was quite shocked by the response and, and, and really found it difficult to respond. Um, so UEA was attacked by the media for not getting out there. Uh, this was a false attack, uh, possibly as post justification by, by the media. Um, we did in fact, 
conduct something like 37 interviews in the few days following the release of the stolen emails. Uh, the main public face of the denier campaign was a, a Canadian, uh, Steve McIntyre. Uh, the denialists at that time seemed to have direct lines to many in the media. The hack itself, the police took this seriously and categorised it as, as a category A crime in the UK. Uh, this is the category that, that homicide uh, is in. Counter-terrorist police were involved and, and a number of organisations in the UK and internationally. Uh, the claims from the extracts from the stolen emails and other stolen documents were that crew had manipulated the data, had destroyed original data and had distorted the peer review process. The police investigation closed in 2012 and the hackers were not found. So the, the impact at UEA, Phil was, as I mentioned, was, was badly affected. He found it difficult to answer questions. We had to trawl through thousands of emails and documents. What did the cherry pick phrases mean? This took days to determine, were they real emails? Were they real um, emails? Uh, what did the, um, the, the, the conversations mean? In particular, one conversation which the denier lists, the deniers homed in on was, I've just completed Mike's nature trick to hide the decline. This was a coffee room conversation. Trick was a technique of the trade, a statistical technique, and decline referred to a decline in the relationship between tree rings and the observed temperature record, not the decline of global warming, as the deniers claimed. Uh, and, and this divergence, this decline, had been known about for 15 or so years and indeed had been published uh, on about crew. We commissioned an independent inquiry, the first university to do this on this scale. It cost uh, hundreds of thousands of, of dollars. It took much longer than we anticipated. And in in, in reality, it, it hamstrung us to an extent because senior members of the university, including me, were in PERDA so as to not risk to be seen prejudices, prejudicing the outcome of this independent inquiry. Eventually, 11 independent inquiries were conducted, um, including uh, two by the UK House of Commons, all vindicated the scientists and confirmed the science. In the photograph there, you see Phil Jones giving evidence to the House of Commons. I'm also there in the background as a VP for research and Phil's successor as director of crew, Tim Osborne, is also in the photograph. The vindication covered 8% of the column inches in the print media of the original scandal. And then usually on the inside pages rather than on the front pages. No medium apologized for the original false accusations except the BBC for one program and then the apology has to be wrested from it. Now, some say that Climate Gate led to a lost decade in action on climate change. This, of course, is very difficult to determine, but it certainly seemed to have had an impact on public opinion. Here is one example from Australia. We can never be confident that we're comparing like to like with uh, with these sort of data over time. But public opinion on the importance of climate change did take a hit after the banking crisis of 2008, 2009, 
and climate gate may well have exacerbated that effect. There seems to be a suggestion of that in that graph. And it went on and is still going on. Claim last year about the hack uh, in the blogosphere and Mr. Trump has made a, an occasional reference to climate gate. Now, denialism can be by omission as well as by permission. I visited the fantastic dinosaur exhibition at the Tyrell Museum in Alberta last year. Fabulous exhibition, much reference to climate change on geological timescales and also uh, the effects of humans on the, the landscape and the ecology over the last centuries to millennium. I was expecting to see something on climate now and climate in the future. Uh, as I got towards the end of the exhibition, it was just this small notice at the side of the exit door. Are the ice ages returning? Now, a number of lessons for us at, at UEA, but also I think for science generally. Um, the second lesson there in bold, with few honorable exceptions, the science establishment, the science world was too weak and uncoordinated. It was frozen in the headlights. Also, I think confirmation that peer review is precious and its standards need to be understood and jealously protected. Peer review means that the, the history of data sets are understood and we can have confidence in the provenance of data and their validity, although there can be exceptions. Deniers claim that crew would not release their data, would not release data from thousands of observation stations around the globe. So proving that crew had cheated. In fact, more than 95% of those data were already in the public domain and the rest was subject to non-publication agreements in the individual national meteorological organizations. But they could be requested from those national meteorological organizations. I think that the, the current crisis around the, the virus has, on one hand, seemingly ushered in a renewed respect for scientists in some countries where politicians and media have been denigrating expert opinion for a number of years. Uh, the claims in some countries have been in the virus crisis that we've been following the science, but there are dangers too. Top journalists, top journals have recently published articles which were based on faulty or fictitious data. So even when the urgency is extreme, as it is in this pandemic, we need to confirm data sources and remember that scientific knowledge is built. It is unlikely that a new poorly resourced outfit like Sergisphere had exclusive access to a previously unknown massive data set, unknown to the rest of the scientific world, a data set acquired from hospitals around the world. Crew's data was in the public domain and had been known about for decades and several other established research groups had worked on that or similar data sets with similar conclusions. Now charlatans will eventually be called out by the peer reviewer process, but significant short-term damage can be done in the meantime with irresponsible politicians being given a period of sunshine in which to make hay. That might be a, a very easy criticism to make at the 
at the current time when the world is hungry for more scientific knowledge about the virus, about the coronavirus, but we still need to determine and judge the science method. Also in the UK, politicians have been allowed to get away with, for too long, with a claim that they have been over the last two or three months when they have been following the science, when they haven't. Or they have been following the most convenient science. Scientists need to be genuinely independent. I can't understand why in the UK, for example, why the top government scientists on the UK's Science Advisory Group for Emergencies, SAGE, did not insist that its membership was published right from the start. And I can't understand why the scientists did not insist that the minutes of its meetings were also published. We now have the ludicrous situation, but a necessary situation where there's an alternative independent sage chaired by a former government chief scientist. Science still 10 years on from climate gate, still needs a strong, independent, coordinated, confident voice. Will COVID make effective action on climate change more or less likely? Difficult to call, but climate change is still the big one. And global water futures has a very important role to play in facing up to this big one. Are we more resilient to strange episodes such as Climate Gate? I'm going to hand over to, to John now to perhaps answer that question which I posed there on that slide. And John also from a, at least from a UK perspective, and you'll have to forgive the, the local dimension here, any help you can give on that second wave will be gratefully received. Thank you, Professor Davies. Uh, the, uh, the questions you pose and the situation that you, you went through is uh, horrific. It's the nightmare of any scientist or scientific organization. And the, um, the concerted effort uh, to destroy uh, scientific information and discredit it is, is of course, rather exceptional. But the best practices that were developed by many years at the University of East Anglia and elsewhere to engage the public with science have been an inspiration uh, to many efforts around the world, including uh, in Canada, the Global Water Futures Program. And so what I would like to do in following on is to discuss uh, how we try to answer this question. How can we communicate science to inform response to the climate crisis. Uh, bring forward a photograph from a demonstration. Every disaster movie starts with the government ignoring a scientist. Uh, but then also the um, uh, very terrible pictures from Calgary uh, on the weekend when it had a billion dollar storm in a little more than an hour. Uh, intense rainfall, not fully measured, but it looks like um, uh, easily 75 millimeters with heavy hail, uh, golf ball sized hail. You see these homes just uh, trashed by them. Looks like a war zone, cars broken up. Uh, the RCMP were rescuing people from the Deerfoot Trail by canoe and by boat. And, and so the um, so, so we, we have evidence of climate crisis and, and it's associated water crisis with us all the time. And it behooves scientists uh, to work and help to explain this to the public, but also to uh, help to offer the solutions and advise on a path forward for society as we deal with a wave uh, that uh, makes this uh, little pandemic, horrible as it is, uh, will we'll make it seem minor in contrast. The um, uh, one thing before I go further, uh, the, uh, this whole uh, material that I'm putting together uh, it comes from the Global Water Futures Program. Uh, we spoke a bit about that before, but the, uh, its uh, largest water and 
uh, research network in the world. It's based in Canada. It involves 15 universities, over 160 professors at those universities, and almost 600 students, researchers, engineers, uh, research managers associated with the program. So absolutely massive and a large international component as well. Um, we do have links to the UK through a water security alliance based out of uh, Cardiff University and others at Bristol, Bath, and Birmingham, Exeter. Um, but in, in, uh, in the Global Water Futures Program, we, we have communications officers, we have outreach officers, and we have knowledge mobilization officers uh, that help tremendously in uh, getting our material outside of the research network uh, to our users and to the public. And so uh, people such as Stephanie Merrill, Mark Ferguson, Stacey DeMancy, Catherine Wharton, Morgan Bratton, Nancy Gauthier, and others uh, have been absolutely critical to this and I've drawn heavily on their material. There are some key messages that uh, we've tried to encapsulate in one slide from Global Water Futures about the uh, crisis that we're in right now. One is that despite the fact that Canada is a water rich country, we're not a water secure country. And that's because of climate change and the way we've managed our water. Um, our economy is uh, heavily water based uh, through all aspects of it. Um, and the uh, and our water availability is also not evenly distributed. Basically, our population tends to be in the south and our water tends to be in the north. And so uh, we do have areas that are water short and semi-arid uh, throughout the country and um, have water management problems. We also have tremendous water quality problems uh, going on. We've uh, had tremendous expenses from extreme events associated with climate change floods and droughts, and then uh, the follow-on from drought, which is wildfire, and uh, costs have exceeded $28 billion in the last few years. The uh, Part of this is because Canada is warming faster than the rest of the world, two times, warm, two times the global average warming. In northern Canada, three times the global average warming. And so we're losing our snow and ice and our, our natural hydrological cycle. At the same time as our population is increasing, as our economic need for water is growing, and as uh, we have a greater food production capability in many areas, but also uh, greater needs to ensure safe uh, drinking waters uh, draining from those agricultural lands. So Global Water Futures coming from this, uh, a large network. These are some of the institutions involved in it. Uh, there are more now uh, than this and the original core, Saskatchewan, Waterloo, McMaster, and Laurier. So we're very fortunate to obtain a grant of $78 million from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund of the federal government, uh, which allowed this sort of big approach to science. It also allows us a, a substantial approach to communication. Three aspects to our mission. One is to improve disaster warning associated with water and climate. The second is predict water futures, what our future water supply and conditions will be in Canada and elsewhere and help inform adaptation to climate change and inform risk management and solutions uh, through this. So uh, uh, important part of the mission and um, core to Global Water Futures has been a transdisciplinary approach. I didn't know this word five years ago, six years ago. Um, I do now and it's, uh, it's fundamental to what we do. This is uh, moving the academic institution out of the ivory tower, working with our uh, stakeholders and users in every aspect of the project from the definement of its original goals and objectives uh, to working on the methodologies uh, to involvement with the analysis and conclusions. Um, we've uh, even taken further steps to uh, uh, bring in indigenous community leaders as co-principal investigators of projects that involve indigenous uh, water management and, and water issues. So the, uh, uh, you have the continuous engagement in knowledge exchange uh, in and out of the research program uh, with those users, and that's a true knowledge mobilization and true transdisciplinarity. So, um, and ultimately we co-create the outcomes and, joint, and also work on joint action to implement move towards implementation of some of the uh, scientific findings and solutions in society and through governments and through industry and, and other associations and civil society. So it's a, uh, a continuous 
process there to do this. One example, as I mentioned, uh, uh, water in indigenous communities is an incredibly important topic in Canada. The state of drinking water in First Nation communities across the country a few years ago was absolutely appalling. It's still not fixed. Uh, it's getting better, and uh, but it's uh, there are more issues uh, than drinking water quality affecting First Nations from uh, water availability uh, to flooding uh, to drought uh, to ability to manage their lands and have indigenous knowledge incorporated in water management decisions. We, uh, I believe, were the first uh, organization to have a national scientific meeting on a First Nations territory, and that was our first annual science meeting for Global Water Futures, which we uh, held and uh, was co-hosted with the Six Nations of the Grand River uh, in Ontario. And that was a, a wonderful meeting. We learned so much. We had such wonderful engagement uh, with that First Nation and others who attended. And, um, and so we, uh, examples like this are what I think transdisciplinarity really is. But it's a very powerful thing because it, uh, by opening the doors to the ivory tower and, uh, and moving out of it, uh, then uh, the distinction between the, the scientists, the researchers, and the rest of society lessens. And you can't have us versus them dialogue showing up. So today with Global Water Futures, uh, there are 39 projects. In fact, we've just approved a dozen more, so that will shortly be 51. Um, the, uh, we tie into programs such as UNESCO's International Hydrological Program, the World Meteorological Organization, the World Climate Research Program, Future Earth. Um, we have observations across Canada, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, many uh, investigators, but also 335 partners where we've had an exchange of letters and communication, and there are real transdisciplinary partnerships uh, with these individuals or organizations in Canada and, uh, and some outside of the country as well. So how do we operationalize this? And one is that uh, we, we, we had to, we felt we had to train our in, internal investigators, students, postdocs, and others on what knowledge mobilization was and what the best practices are. So our knowledge mobilization team conducts a series of webinars uh, that have been ongoing through the project on uh, basically how to conduct co-learning, how to engage with users, uh, how to uh, truly uh, uh, develop strong relationships with the uh, stakeholders and water users and, and, and do it in a respectful way. So this has been ongoing uh, through the program and I think highly successful to have that training and often our young scientists are the best ambassadors we could possibly have uh, uh, moving forward with this. The, um, we also uh, have engaged users and want to ensure that we have equity, diversity, and inclusivity across our network, again, as a way to uh, the further the full engagement within the scientific community and the outside. And so one lecture series uh, that's uh, been developed and running is Women in Water, uh, initially uh, uh, proposed by Dr. Kareen Schuster-Wallace. And this... Uh, you know, support young professionals, uh, dialogue space for them to work in, but also uh, with outside groups. And so uh, deals with <clears throat> issues that have come up of importance of gender-based water-related impacts, critical for many societies, as well as opportunities facing female uh, researchers and their challenges. Associated with this is relationship building. The, uh, you have to build those relationships, nurture them, this takes years, decades sometimes, and maintain engagement with them at all stages of the research. And, uh, you know, one thing we've done every year is have an Ag Water Research Expo uh, with hundreds of researchers and users together. And uh, we, we talk about the science, uh, we have discussions, um, and uh, we have those uh, fantastic roundtable discussions in it that have been so good. We uh, can't do it now because of COVID, so we're having this uh, next week on the 25th as a uh, virtual uh, workshop uh, dealing with agriculture and water, and uh, in this case relating to the Canada Water Agency as a, um, an element where we'd like to uh, see what the needs are and the advice can be for that particular agency. So 
uh, you can go to the GWF website and register for that webinar. It's in two parts, and uh, Ralph Goodale, uh, a uh, former member of parliament with tremendous interest in this topic, is going to speak at that particular event. The, um, and that leads to the various national water policy initiatives because the, uh, as part of that uh, communication and, and knowledge mobilization engagement, has been working with the key federal departments uh, on this. And I've mentioned agriculture uh, already, but Environment Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, are tremendously important for the water file and therefore for global water futures. And so we've worked with them on flood forecasting workshops on a joint national water prediction strategy. Uh, work closely with the scientists from the climate branch, the meteorological branches, the hydrological uh, groups, and elsewhere. Another one is Natural Resources Canada. Uh, this is where the forestry service, groundwater research, glacier research, remote sensing is involved. And uh, so uh, we held a, a science summit with them in Ottawa to sort of see where water research is in the federal government and um, how we can link to it and how it can uh, that w the group of water researchers hadn't met together for a long time. So I think it was useful from both ends to sort of map out where things were, what we should do together and what the priority should be. I've mentioned that sustainable agricultural water uh, solutions uh, uh, webinar next week. And uh, one effort we've had is uh, called, we call water security for Canadians. And this has been uh, working together with uh, outside organizations such as FLOW and others and uh, base of a, a seminar uh, several weeks ago here to uh, look at what a Canada Water Agency might be and what it might do and what's the point of it. Uh, can it actually help us and have these uh, very deep discussions and so webinars, white papers and other strategies have come out from that. Internationally, uh, we engage very strongly through a number of organizations I mentioned already. Uh, there's more on here. Uh, we work closely with India on the Himalayas. We work closely with China on the Tibetan Plateau and with a little Nepal in between. The, um, we've been working on uh, modeling as a way of exporting our science with uh, India and Israel, Kazakhstan, China, Nepal, Argentina, Chile, Spain, US, many others. Uh, also engaged with the United Nations on the water action decade. And, uh, and so that's a, a critically important part of our of our operation to bring that international part and uh, bring Canada out to the world and to engage globally at a significant level and I believe we have. It's important to have resources for knowledge mobilization and so our KM team has put together a planning guide. They have a knowledge mobilization strategy which is uh, critically important and uh, and all of our projects are tasked with having a knowledge mobilization communication plan. So in the smallest project has this component to it. It is top to bottom uh, throughout global water futures and uh, critical to what we do. And then finally, the impact from this. How do we articulate uh, uh, when and how we have meaningful impact on climate and water security? And that's uh, digital storytelling is one way, but this is the engagement with the media and the uh, both responding to outside events, but also to make sure that scientific advances and solutions are communicated uh, broadly out to society. And so one thing we try to do is to foster a national conversation on climate and water security to make sure that it's well informed. And we've done this in many, many ways. Uh, in the last year, 48 news, release, or, or 48 news releases since we started in 2016. Um, all of these have been picked up in some way and a wide range of articles, uh, whether it's climate change or, uh, or the Great Lakes or water sharing, um, the uh, idea of rainwater harvesting, uh, things like this. Uh, so it goes on all the time. Um, and the, it's important that, we, um, that when Mother Nature sends a message to humanity through extreme events, uh, that we are there to help explain that and uh, to bring that information, uh, the science behind understanding this to people in a meaningful way. We did this before Global Water Futures very much with the 2013 floods in uh, southeastern BC and, and uh, southern Alberta. 
And that started really a general discussion in society about, uh, gosh, you know, we are not handling climate change very well. We're not dealing with the impacts very well. And we need to organize ourselves uh, much more carefully to, to move forward. So these can lead on to great things. The um, also events can be people. Occasionally you get an exceptional individual such as Greta Thunberg who came through Canada last October and wanted to see a glacier. So we obliged and we took her up on the Athabasca Glacier to see conditions there were not ideal, but she's a very brave person and was up there. And uh, we're able to uh, bring out scientific messaging to that, uh, not necessarily the advocacy of action on climate change. She does that perfectly well by herself but the uh, scientific dimensions that underpin a decision like that, such as the retreat of the glaciers and the uh, uh, provenance of extreme events. And we had, uh, we had lots of interest in that particular aspect. And then tying to that very strongly, uh, because it was just the next month, or sort of later the same month, month was a high mountain, mountain summit that Global Water Futures co-chaired at the Bureau of Meteorological Organization in Switzerland. And we, we were able to, uh, get uh, cross country, 45 countries to agree to a call for action on integrated observations and predictions in the high mountains around the world. And uh, that's no mean feat. We we're able to pull it off and there was tremendous uh, media exposure uh, for this. So we're getting that science message out again. And so you can build these things up in, in many ways. And then the focus of this group, art and science is a brilliant way to, uh, to combine art, to use art to communicate science in ways that uh, scientists themselves would never conceive of. And I think we can reach the, the depth and core of humanity in uh, a much more fundamental way than a scientific graph or, or chart can. So Gennady Ivanov, who uh, uh, painted uh, th this sketch here on a, of the Athabasca Glacier again, weather's a little bit better than when Greta Thunberg was up and uh, presenting this in Norwich Cathedral in, in England, uh, in Canmore. There's an exhibition on right now running through the summer uh, at three different installations in the town. And these things are, uh, can be very powerful themselves. And with the advent of the conversation, uh, which is a um, electronic media and it has a branch in Canada called the Conversation Canada, the most Canadian universities have subscribed to Academics can now write the news and you can write a scientific article. You have to, uh, it has to be credible. It has to be uh, fact checkable. It has to be backed up by sources and you can do this. And sometimes they'll be picked up by other media as well, as you've seen. So these are some of the articles we've been involved with. So active approach to communications is critically important. Um, Catherine Warden, our communications officer for the University of Saskatchewan, uh, has measured through a site called Shijun that there were 480 million readers of GWF news stories in 2018-2019. Uh, that to me is just absolutely staggering that this can happen. But, the, uh, but there's lots of science and because of that active communications and KM team, lots of media interest in what's going on. And this helps inform society and it helps us make good decisions as a civilization. It's important for follow through on this as well. Bob Sanford has had no small role at all in developing these strategies and working with him over the last 13 years has been a wonderful experience for me uh, because he understands uh, to his core how to communicate and better than uh, any scientist out there. So he can help us link to these things. And here's an article we wrote together five years ago um, uh, suggesting and, and proposing a Canada Water Agency. And uh, there will be an op-ed in the Globe and Mail tomorrow um, on the same topic, telling the federal government to finish the job. So uh, you have to give after people. But um, anyway, but thank you, Bob, for getting this discussion going. So that's all I have. A few considerations as one, um, as one moves forward. The, uh, we have constantly changing scientific findings. Uh, scientific results shift over time because of the scientific method. They're never constant. We have to be able to explain that in ways uh, that are understandable by those who are non-scientists, not involved in, this, in these particular endeavors. And um, while I don't think governments should blindly take scientific advice, advice and just follow the science, it's never quite that simple because 
science is not a monolith, uh, having the uh, scientific results and the fruits of the scientific method available for decision makers, I think is a tremendously important thing. And when we've seen societies that have done this, and very recently in the pandemic, we've seen better performance and fewer deaths and fewer infections by the governments that have heeded scientific advice and taken it into account in their decision making. And so the, uh, we hope that we have an, a very nice example now on how to avoid the disaster uh, due to climate and water crisis that we are in the midst of as well in the future. That was incredible. What a wealth of knowledge. We have um, several questions here. Um, this first one I'm just going to ask is to Dr. Pomeroy. How does your work on the prairie hydrological model indicate about the relative value of restoring wetlands for the future of flood management? Oh, yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's one component of Global Water Futures that is involved in a project called Prairie Water. And, um, and we've shown that uh, wetland uh, conservation, but also restoration is incredibly effective in restoring the natural water functioning of uh, prairie drainages. And the, uh, but also particularly, uh, you know, we had a lot of flooding uh, several years ago in the prairies, and the, we found that peak flows could be reduced substantially. It was uh, the most powerful land use control that you could actually manage the peak flows through wetland restoration. You could reduce those peak flows substantially. And, and this is critically important because there, uh, we're in a, a tough situation because of uh, wetter conditions on the prairies. Uh, farmers are sometimes draining depressions or wetlands so they can farm and, and get the water off their fields and carry on producing food. Um, but at the same time, that enhances uh, water uh, flows and sometimes flooding downstream. And that becomes very difficult to manage overall. And very quite often, some of the people that are... Um, draining or also getting flooded from upstream. So it's a very complex situation. So we're trying to model this and show where the vulnerable areas of the prairies are and where it makes sense uh, to uh, perhaps rather strictly uh, deal with wetland restoration and certainly conservation and other areas where it may have less impact. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing at that model. And this one's for Dr. Trevor Davies. Um, how does the peer review process, how has the peer review process changed since Climate Gate? Yes, that, 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 that is a very interesting question indeed. Um, uh, within uh, climate science, uh, there is more attention now played on, on data sets and an expectation that climate scientists will explain more about their data. Um, there's, um, I think that's probably the, the single most important um, uh, change uh, and uh, people who the scientists who uh, are submitting uh, the public publications are also um, expecting and being more open in volunteering information um, and not taking it for granted that people understand that that data sets are reliable because several groups have been working on them for, for many, many years, uh, and that there are scores or hundreds of publications related to that data set, those data sets, but making the data sets themselves catalog better, manage better, the inventories are much better. So climate science, I think that's probably the single most important effect it's had on, on, on peer review. Thank you. And uh, I think this one's for you, uh, Dr. Pomeroy. Is the creation of the Canada Water Agency critical to demonstrate that the federal government has committed to independent, reliable science to support a more secure water future for Canada? Yes. Okay, that was good. Um, so, yeah, could I say something about data very quickly, though? Um, uh, data management has changed in Canada a lot in the last 10 years. And we have a data management team of four people in Global Water Futures, and we require all scientists to archive all of their data uh, in a publicly accessible form as a condition of their funding uh, throughout the program. And what we're working on right now are very sophisticated computer programs to allow people to search these data sets, whether it's water quality or quantity or climate data or use and others, and bring it out. 
The only data that are uh, kept um, hidden, uh, there are, could be health data or personal data, things like that, or privileged data such as from indigenous communities that can't be openly accessed in such a way. But everything that can be openly accessed is and will be. And that's, um, so that, that's as part of the progression of science as, as we move on. Um, and on that note, you mentioned, uh, this is for Dr. Davies, you mentioned the importance of peer reviewed and it must be protected, but what is the scientific community doing to make sure that peer review process is carefully monitored since there have been distorted results that have gotten past the peer reviewed process? Um, yes, um, the, the, some doubtful research will unfortunately always get through. Um, uh, the simple answer to that to that very challenging question um, is that eventually peer review will pin down faulty science, wrong science. We need to remember, as 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 John Pomeroy has indicated, that the science method builds science, knowledge develops, um, and and our interpretation of data of models also evolves as as we as we as we know more i think i think in climate in climate science because of of climate gate there is this that the, the, there was a stepping back and say we well let's not where there has been a temptation in the past to cut corners because uh publications because researchers want rapid publication because journals are chasing up reviewers there perhaps has been a tendency to to cut corners. I think that's step back um, now in climate science. But as as I indicated in those examples from from the virus, you know, faulty data, fictitious data can still get through. But eventually, peer review will will pin it down. I hope. Excellent. And this Climate and the Artist Weekly webinar series is presented by the Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society in partnership with the Ecoforestry Institute Society and John O'Reardon of the Gail O'Reardon Climate and the Arts Legacy Series. Now, John O'Reardon is a former Deputy Minister of the Environment, and you've got a summary of why science is more important than ever and water is the nexus of climate. Plus, do you have some good news for us, Jonathan? Oh, we've got good news for you. <laughs> okay, well then, over to you. I'd like to thank uh, Trevor Davis and John Pomeroy for a very powerful presentation on the importance of independence and expert science in checking our global water futures. As French and, uh, Francis mentioned, water is ground zero for climate change. It is the heart of what we call the climate nexus, which is the intersection of food, energy, and biodiversity. So as water becomes more insecure in the future, then it has a ripple effect on the security of our food systems, our energy systems, and our healthy biodiversity systems. So why is science so important in this age of climate change? Well, science tells us that uh, as the atmosphere warms, and for every degree Celsius, the atmosphere warms, the, it can hold 7% more moisture. So it's reasonable to assume that by the end of the century, the amount of moisture held in the atmosphere will be up to 20% more than we had when we started the global warming cycle. This means much more severe storms, stronger hurricanes, stronger tornadoes, and stronger events of flooding. So it's critical that we have a science base to track this change in the way the, climate, the global water balance is, is changing over time with climate. So over the past uh, 10,000 years, we've had what we call a natural range of variation in our climate system. That means that even though we get warm and wet years and dry and cooler years, they have bandied within a natural range of variation. But this chart shows schematically how that range of variation can start to increase dramatically as a result of climate change. So that we can have much more extreme events so events that were occurred maybe once a hundred years now occur once every 20 years. And we saw from John Pomeroy's presentation that we had an extreme thunderstorm in Calgary just on the weekend, which was probably a once in a lifetime event. And I heard from my family today in the UK that there were severe thunderstorms in the Midlands that 
dumped one inch, one month worth of rain uh, on the Midlands in a matter of one hour. So we can expect these extreme events to increase dramatically as the globe warms over the next several decades. And we'll continue to do so as we pump more carbon into the atmosphere. So we need to bend the climate, the carbon curve, just as we have bent the COVID curve by working together and reducing our collective carbon footprints. More than ever, we need sound, independent, reliable science to track these changes in the global water balance and bring them to the attention of policymakers and decision makers. So I think we're truly blessed to have the global water futures in Canada and led by John Pomeroy and Bob Sanford and Trevor Davis. And they will conduct and promote and demonstrate the importance of water science in securing our water futures. I'd like to remind the viewers that three weeks ago, we crafted a letter indicating the importance of a Canada Water Agency based on good science and the need to improve our forecasting for floods and, and changes in the water balance. And we will repost that letter uh, on Friday uh, with the video of this today series so that people have an opportunity to send it to their MPs and MLAs and politicians and to their friends to encourage us to continue to have a reliable science base in Canada to deal with this wonderful resource we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I'd like to thank our audience, Dr. Trevor Davies, Bob Sanford, and Dr. John Pomeroy for joining us today. We are most grateful. Thank you again.